Good morning, everybody. Uh, if you haven't gotten your beer, go back and get your beer. Uh, we're going to do a toast. Don't open it yet. We're going to do a toast uh, and uh, to kick off the conference. So uh, grab a beer if you don't uh, have one yet. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Paul Leone. I'm the executive director, uh, your executive director for the New York State Brewers Association. To kick things off, I'd like to introduce Rich Vandenberg, the president of your New York State Brewers Association. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Paul. I want to first start out by uh, thanking Paul and his uh, staff and his team with uh, Chloe and Jen, uh, Kim, Katja. We've done, a, I think, an outstanding job. You know, first of all, we're back. Here we are. We're back. So I think they've done an outstanding job setting up this venue. It's a great venue. We've, we've moved over from uh, the Desmond. We have a little bit more room to spread out. I don't know if anybody noticed, but we're under the lights of New, York's, New York State over here in the ceiling. Uh, it's pretty cool. So um, I hope you, you uh, are all going to have a great day. So it's, let me start. It's my distinct honor and privilege to welcome all of you to the New York State Craft Brewers Conference. I start my term as president of the association this year. And I'm excited for what lies ahead. It's been a, it has been and continues to be a crazy world, but we're fortunate to live and work in, in a safe place called New York. From Buffalo to the Capital District to New York City and the eastern reaches of Long Island, we are a wide, talented, and expansive craft region. We may be called an association, but in truth, we are a family a family of diverse views, of different backgrounds, and of varying experiences. We must embrace that diversity and champion what makes us strong. As a family of brewers, we rely upon each other when needed and support each other when called. We rejoice in those happy moments and console others when we are not. It's what a close family does. So let's take a moment to remember to remember a few who are not with us today. We remember Corey Drake. Corey was a brewer in the Finger Lakes region for 10 years, most recently at Two Goats Brewing right across Seneca Lake in Burdett. In April 2021, Corey passed away suddenly and unexpectedly at the age of 32. We also remember Tommy Keegan. Tommy was a good friend to many. He was the founder and owner of Keegan Ales. Opening his brewery in Kingston in 2003, Tommy was larger than life and known by many, if not most, in the New York brewing community. He too passed away unexpectedly in April 2021 at the age of 50. And most recently, we remember Angelica Zingarino. Angelica was a brewer at Common Roots, known as an unassuming bright light that illuminated every room she walked into. She was a daughter, a granddaughter, a girlfriend, a student, and in her ultimate dream job as a brewer. Angelica was especially proud to be part of the brewing community, not, o not only because she loved craft beer, but more because she loved the people in the brewing community. After having completed a degree in brewing sciences, she ultimately became a founding member of the Upstate New York Pink Boots Society. Her focus and work in growing the female influence within craft beer was deeply valued, and she was headed to be one of the best and brightest in our community. Angelica tragically lost her battle with cancer, but her light continues to shine brilliantly through all those she touched. She was 30 years old. Our association, our family, mourns these losses, but we will celebrate their lives and their memories shall be a blessing to us all. I would ask for a moment of silence in their honor. Thank you. So over the next two days, you will have the ability to learn, share, and collaborate with your fellow brewers, neighbors, and friends. We will celebrate and be inspired by the stories, the challenges, the lessons we each have. We will gather together, be energized, and build renewed passion for our craft. We should all remember that you are looked upon 
by other state guilds with great respect and admiration for all you do in producing some of the best beer in the country. This CBC is considered one of the best, if not the best, in the country. And the knowledge, talent, and expertise that we all have to access to here only supports those views. So as you listen, learn, and share during this conference, remember, we are New York State craft brewers, and our mission must remain focused on how we continue to grow and nurture the New York State craft beer brand, grow and solidify the New York State craft beer allegiance and grow and secure a New York State craft beer presence in every bar, on every tap, in every glass. So let's enjoy our ourselves, but remember, please remain focused on our mission of building New York craft beer, have fun, and I'll see everybody at the conference. Thank you very much. Sorry, I got to do that. That was pretty awesome looking out. Um, forgive my nerves. Uh, it's been a while since uh, being in front of you all, um, but welcome. Um, we appreciate you all being here. So uh, welcome to the fourth annual New York State Craft Brewers Conference. Um, this year's conference is uh, presented by Deutsche Be Beverage Technology, so thank you for being our conference sponsors. Uh, we have a big few days ahead of us, but before we get started, I wanted to thank our conference sponsors um, who help us make this happen. Without your support, um, none of this would be possible. I also want to thank our official sponsoring partners who sponsor us uh, the whole year long, so thank you. Uh, thank you guys so much for uh, supporting us. Uh, again, thank you Deutsche Beverage Technology for being presenting sponsor uh, for the next three years. We very much appreciate your support and thank you uh, Rare Form Brewing for the beer that we're going to toast here in just a few minutes uh, to officially kick off the conference. Uh, each year, oh that's it right there, sorry. Uh, each year, ABS Commercial offers a scholarship to three New York State breweries. Uh, in order to win a free conference pass to two nights hotel stay, the brewery must write an essay describing how they directly impact their local community. This year we received 20 inspiring uh, submissions. The winners, oops, sorry. The winners uh, are Binghamton Brewing, Wolf and Warrior Brewing, and uh, Broken Bow Brewery. So thank you ABS for sponsoring this scholarship once again this year. And congratulations to the winners um, for all that you guys do in your community. Um, uh, every year, the NYSB has a board seat elections in three regions. If you're a board member, uh, you're allowed to vote in your region. Two board members retain their seats, but we did add a board member from the Western region, Jeff Ware, with Resurgence Brewing, and we added an at-large seat with Don Schultz with Prison City Brewing. So welcome. The board also elected new officers in 2021. The new officers are Kevin Mullen with Rare Form as secretary, Chris Spinelli, Rock Brewing as treasurer, Hutch Kugeman is our new vice president with the brewery at CIA, and Rich Vandenberg, who you just heard from is our new president. Um, our annual meeting is tomorrow morning, um, so please try to do that. We'll go over financials. Please come to that. It is a members only meeting, so tomorrow morning the annual meeting will be mem uh, members only. So uh, Rich is our new president. I think it's important um, that we recognize Chris Erickson for his three years uh, as president. Thank you, Chris. Uh, <laughs> your leadership, friendship uh, uh, really means a lot. Uh, and thank you for, for uh, helping me with my mental health over the last few, uh, few years. I appreciate it. Um, before we introduce this morning's keynote speaker, uh, you were all given, you were all given uh, the conference beer. This was not my idea, by the way. Um, uh, <laughs> Um, official conference beer this morning. Please don't open it yet. These were generously donated by Rare Form Brewing and sponsored by Crosby Hops, Country Malt Group, and TLF Graphics. So thank you uh, for doing that. We try to do the conference beer every year. Uh, this is fun. The name of the beer uh, is very humbling, I have to be honest. Um, when the pandemic shut everything down, our job as the New York State Brewers Association was to make sure we did everything we could to be a resource for you. Even though it was me that you primarily heard from, it really was a team effort. Uh, um, even though that the beer, uh, even though your first reaction through all of this was to email or call Paul uh, through this, I couldn't have been there for you if Jen Myers uh, didn't organize and execute the virtual events to raise money. Uh, if Chloe Kay 
uh, hadn't been there to create all the signage to give to you all and send out communications regularly. If Megan Connolly Haupt wasn't there um, to work with all of our allied and sponsoring partners, supporting them so they can continue to support us. The NYSBA, was the, the, the board of directors was there for us uh, every step of the way, supporting the staff and keeping us employed so that we could be there for you. I need to extend a special thank you to Kim Porter um, for joining the team and taking over and organizing this conference. Amazing what, what she's been able to do. And our newest member, Katya Harris, Director of Partnerships, uh, for working with the partners and keeping that, those relationships going. So thank you, team. Sorry, there they are, sorry, I'm behind, I'm behind, oh, there we go. So even though um, this year's conference beer is Better Call Paul, I say let's raise your beer and give a cheers to the NYSBA Board of Directors, the NYSBA staff, and most importantly you for being here today. Uh, we appreciate it. So we were just doing our job, working for you every day, so let's count down before we open. Three, oh, you guys just did it. Come on, I thought I wrote in my notes to wait just a second. So I was gonna say, for those that didn't open their beer, let's open it in three, two, one. There we go, that's the sound we were looking for right there. So cheers to you all. Thank you for being here, weathering the storm. As I fumbled through that. Um, I think everyone has heard of this guy before. Uh, our keynote speaker, Sam Calagione, opened Dogfish Head in 1995. It's grown into a 400 plus person company and is one of the most recognized breweries in the country. In July 2019, Dogfish Head proudly merged with Boston Beer Company. Sam's innovative style and collaborative spirit has earned him a reputation as one of the industry's most adventurous entrepreneurs and brewers. Sam has authored four books and was named the James Beard Foundation's Outstanding Wine Spirits and Beer Professional in 2017. On a personal note, um, I've known Sam since 2004 when I was a young TV producer wanting to do a TV show about craft beer. I read a story about a guy in Delaware making off-centered ales for off-centered people, uh, and so I emailed him, and he answered. Um, and so, long story short, we shot two TV pilots together uh, on beer. Thank you, Sam, for, for playing along in my little experiment. Needless to say, nobody ever saw them because it never got picked up because it wasn't wine, uh, and, and TV people really didn't get it. But Sam did just fine by himself without me, uh, obviously, so doing the Discovery Channel uh, show. So we are very fortunate to have Sam Calagione as our first keynote speaker. So Sam, welcome to New York and welcome to the conference. And we're going to do, if there's uh, uh, also, folks, this is so cool to see how many people are here. There's a ton of seats down front if anyone wants to come on down while I'm, while I'm talking. There's plenty of seats uh, down here and, and on the sides. And I'll try to stick to like four, 40 minutes or so so that there's time if there's any questions. I got a lot of new friends in the room from last night and tons of old friends. And Fred and Dave, you're not just so old in years. I mean, I've known you a, a long time. Uh, and I just want to start by thanking Paul and the board. Board and uh, you know, Paul, karma is a real thing, and you always exude great karma, and your passion for this community is very real. And that karma comes back to you and your staff for all the awesome work that you do. So I'm so proud, proud of you and your your journey, and thank you for the leadership in behalf of this community. So thank you. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about kind of the dogfish story, kind of through our our our, our journey in the last uh, 27 years, uh, with hopes that some of the things we did right and some of the things we fucked up can inspire you guys as you do things right and fuck up as we all do as entrepreneurs pretty much uh, every week. Uh, so I'll figure out this clicker as we go. Yeah, that's still me. Okay, here we go. So here's our thing. So I'm proudly uh, a guy, uh, a New York boy. I was born in Flushing, Queens in 1969. I got a little sick of the city life and moved out uh, when I was one and a half years old, uh, about 100 miles uh, from here in the Berkshires of Massachusetts, a town called Greenfield, Mass, out on 91. 
And I went to this uh, little uh, school out there called Northfield Mount Hermon. And it was started by this evangelist uh, preacher as to be like a school for underprivileged kids, mostly from Boston, New York, and Chicago. And the mission of this school called Northfield Mount Hermon is uh, uh, educating the head, uh, the heart, and the hand. So head, uh, uh, you know, obviously is the academia. The heart was about they wanted to raise people that would go back into those communities, uh, young, young people, and, and use what they learned to help the, the vibrant of those communities and then uh, the hand was it was a really DIY community we had a working farm and still do uh, on that campus we all did work jobs which was we would clean up after ourselves in the dining room do the laundry stoke the, the fuel in the, in the furnace uh, in the powerhouse so I, I met my wife Mariah who runs dogfish with me when we were in high school uh, out there I was a day student I live right down the road from the school in Western Mass she was from Delaware uh, and we uh, stayed together as, as and, and went to separate colleges, and in the summers, we would go down to the coastal Delaware Beach, where she was from, and we would wait tables and bartends, go back to our colleges. And then after, uh, so I should also say, I, that's really where I got my love of, of storytelling, was at Northfield Mount Hermon. I fell in love with uh, writing and storytelling, uh, and had some great English teachers that inspired me and tried to convince me to be less of a rebellious asshole and focus on uh, my storytelling uh, create, creative skills, but I kind of used the creative of skills for evil more than good in that, in that era, and I actually got kicked out of high school in March of my senior year. So I'm, I'm one of the few people that you'll meet that somehow got a college degree but never actually graduated from high school. It's a rare group of, it's not Mensa, it's a very different group of, of people that don't have high school degrees but have college degrees. So I graduated from college, moved to Manhattan the day after I graduated with aspirations of being a writer, and I was taking courses in the MFA program at Columbia, uh, but to earn my, my, my rent, I worked at a first-gen beer bar on the Upper West Side, I think 111th and Broadway, called Nacho Mama's Burritos, uh, and uh, I and fell in love with good beer. Before that, in high school and college, I just drank the shittiest, you know, cheapest beer I could, and I fell in love with good beer on, on my shift drinks work in there, and one week I had Chimay celebration and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Sierra celebration, Chimay Red, and it blew my mind. And I started homebrewing within weeks of that and, and started writing a business plan uh, within within months of that. Um, and I wrote in the business plan, the, the first page of my bi business plan was this Emerson quote, which is really about the mission of our company to say, hey, we're going to be tiny. I know I'm not, I'm 24 years old. I'm not going to raise a lot of money. So we better do something pretty distinct to stand out. Uh, and then the second page of that plan, I wrote, uh, Dogfish, it'll be the first commercial brewery in America committed to brewing the majority of our beers outside the Rhine Heights boat, incorporating, you know, culinary ingredients in, in that process. And so away we went. I, I raised $220,000 from family, friends. My orthodontist put in $25,000. Uh, and I opened a brewery. I was the fir first brewery in the first state in coastal Delaware. And as I was taking off the shitty sign from the shitty restaurant that I rented that went out of business, and I said, hey, Mariah, stand on the top of the pickup truck and get a photo of me taking off that old sign. So the first thing that happens is we take off the sign of the fa failed restaurant that we were taking over. And there's a sign behind that of another failed restaurant that didn't make it. And we're like, shit, what are we getting ourselves into? So, so then we're, she gets me drilling the dogfish head sign onto the facade, and as, as I'm doing it, a guy walks by and looks at me at the ladder. He goes, Brewings and Eats. You know it's illegal to open a brewery in Delaware, right? I'm like, huh? He's like, yeah, I had a friend who tried in Wilmington, but it's illegal. I was like, oh, shit. So I got in my pickup truck and drove to Dover and just asked people, which one of these is the House of Representatives? Which one's the, the Senate? And I walked in, and I'm like, uh, can I talk to like a senator or someone who makes laws here and uh, uh, much you know Delaware is a very small state and I was able on that day to start drafting the legislation to have the first brew pub law uh, that, 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 that allowed us and other uh, breweries to open and since that day I mean our state has an amazing relationship as does yours between our agricultural community and our entrepreneurial community the DuPont family helped to fund Route 1 to help the southern farmers you know get their, their grain and their goods up to the cities of Wilmington and, and Philly. So the, I got to really thank, and I know you guys work really graciously with, with your legislators here in this amazing uh, city, but it was really a big part of our journey uh, that we were able to get those laws and then distilling laws and wine laws uh, um, uh, written ourselves uh, in our journey. So away we went. We opened the smallest commercial brewery in the country. Of course, this Emerson. Emerson. So it was a half-barrel brewery. I basically plasma-torched the tops off of used 15.5-gallon Sankey K 
kegs, plasma, plasma, you know, welded little sanitary ball valves into the base of them, set up a big rack in a room with a wall air conditioner. I waddle them from my half barrel brewery into this air conditioned room. And then when they, and then I waddle them to, into the cold box, move across, you know, the lettuce and dough out of the way, let them drop cold and then transfer them into side bunk Hoff Stevens, put a penny in the top of it, you know, force carbonate it, roll it behind the bar. It was a hot mess, uh, uh, but it got us in business. Uh, and then the, the second year we opened, we made a five barrel brewery out of used dairy equipment uh, and canning equipment from a, a cannery that went out of business. And in 96, we uh, started hand bottling and that long Emerson quote couldn't fit on the side of a, a six pack. So we shortened it to off-centered ales to off-centered people, which still is the, at the heart of the premise of the Emerson quote, which is we're going to make things that are pretty exotic. Hopefully they piss off some people because they're going to be flavor forward. And hopefully there's some that excite people because they're going to be flavor forward, but they're not going to be, uh, you know, boring was kind of our goal. And we also knew that it wasn't the majority of the consumers we were going to be going for. So we had to kind of find a distinct brand voice that'd be provocative to the kind of people that would want to go on this off-centered journey with us. And right from the day, you know, it sounds like, you know, pretentious to say, oh, a lifestyle company, but we always did want to look at beer as sort of the central engine of the Dogfish Head brand, but use the fuel from that engine to do other creative things that we think would, would complement our approach to brewing, but would also act as portals to bring people into our world through maybe, uh, you know, different, different spaces than in addition uh, to beer. So if that last statement is sort of our mission, our raison d'etre, this is sort of our, our vision for our company. It's sort of an ever, evergreen aspirational um, place that we aspire to. And, you know, the words are carefully chosen, most thoughtfully adventurous, meaning, yeah, we're going to use a bunch of non-traditional exotic ingredients, but the, the liquid actually better taste good, not just sound good on a piece of paper. And moreover, we are in a business, so we have to figure out a way to do these adventurous exotic things in a sustainable way, sustainable ingredient-wise, but also fi financially. And there were years that we were better at that than ever. And also we're admitting in that that beer is the lifeblood of our company. It's the big, big muscle that allows us to, that pumps out what we make coast to coast, but that we have all these other business units that we love equally. They're just of different scales and the scale is really irrelevant to their, their importance uh, to our journey. So here's the campus that I know some of you guys have, have uh, visited where we started in Rehoboth Beach. So we started with a little half barrel uh, brewery and half barrel fermenters. In 96, we built an, a five barrel ourselves. Uh, we never, Dogfish had never bought a, a single new piece of commercial brewing equipment until we were eight years in our, our journey as a company. And when folks come up to, to, to ask me about our, our journey or read a book I wrote called Brewing Up a Business about how we started, uh, I always say when you write that business plan, instead of trying to figure out how big you can be to make it, always try to figure out how small you can be to make it, how little you can spend to do whatever your dream is to do it. And that was certainly our case. We definitely would have gone bankrupt when we fit, faced that first wave of craft beer, you know, challenge challenges in the late 90s. There was a shakeout period and we would have gone bankrupt if we had a traditional bank loan and a full-on uh, new brew brewing system. But because we cobbled it all together ourselves, didn't have a lot of debt, we were able to uh, muscle through that. But here you see our, our, our brew pub. We have a five barrel system there with 10 barrel fermenters. Uh, Brian Selders, our longest tenured brewer, my best friend in the, in the biz, uh, other than my wife Mariah obviously, uh, runs that facility in the canning program there. And those cans are only sold from there. We don't bring them into three tier distro, but they're essentially the marketing focal point uh, of the creativity of that site. We also have a restaurant called Chesapeake and Maine there. And if we use the brew pub as a platform to R&D new beers, Chesapeake and Maine is really the, the stage for our distilling program. And I'll talk about our, our distillery that we've done for over 20 years, but it's uh, called Chesapeake and Maine because 100% uh, of the seafood is sourced d d directly from fishermen in the Chesapeake and Maine region, which again for us lets us tell the story of sustainability and sourcing. Over 90% of seafood sold in American restaurants does not come from America, so that has carbon you know, footprint implications, freshness implications. So while we're talking about fresh you know, beers of quality, we're doing it in the context of great food. Uh, and that the program, cocktail program there, was James Beard nominated at Chesapeake. Maine, and it's where we're R&Ding future foolproof spirit releases and canned cocktail uh, releases under, under our own roofs. 
So I mentioned we were, you know, we're decidedly a second generation craft brewery. Uh, you know, we're, we're sitting with a first generation craft craft brewer and, and Fred literally over a hundred years. Uh, but usually it's the, the movements associated with the pioneers of the late 70s, early 80s, Fritz Maytag uh, at uh, Anchor, Ken Grossman, Jim Cook, um, Dogfish. There was a big wave of breweries opening in the mid 90s. So we were a second gen craft brewery. But I do, uh, we're very proud that we were a first gen craft distillery. I think with the TTB, we were the first distillery to put the word craft in front of distillery uh, for our license. And similarly, that was in the era when we couldn't afford new equipment. So when I was the only delivery guy in a box truck and I would drive, you know, three pallets with 16 kegs down the side to DC, Baltimore, or Philly. And on the way home to Coastal Delaware, I'd call Mariah and say, hey, I should be at our desk, you know, on our Peachtree home software trying to run the brewery's uh, finances. And I'd say, how much money do we have left in the account after payroll this this week. Uh, first, I say, are we going to make payroll this week or are we going to eat at the brewery every night because we can't afford groceries? And if we could make pay, payroll, she'd tell me what we'd have left over and I'd go to Billy Warren's scrapyard because Co coastal Delaware, Delmarva Peninsula is the heart of the poultry industry. It's where like Mount Air and Purdue is. So there's a pretty great, awesome food grade stainless steel that when these big companies, you know, outgrow, it goes to this, this awesome like scrapyard called Billy Warren's scrapyard. And that's where I buy tank and tanks and fittings and triclove and clamps to grow dogfish. And I'm driving by there one day in 91, I look and in, in the mud, there's that uh, capsule shaped thing that had something to do with the, the poultry industry, but it had the exact geometry to be a pot still. So I bought that and we, uh, we uh, welded a, a steam jacket onto the base of it. You can see we welded two Sankey kegs vertically to the left of it for a condensing coil. And we built our own 150 gallon pot still uh, 20 years ago and started R&Ding uh, little recipes, making our cocktails, our gins, our rums, and vodkas with the same goal as what we did with beer, right? We, we wanted to take traditional spirit categories and bring culinary ingredients into them. So local apiaries for the honey in our rum, uh, different varieties of hops and, and citrus peels uh, in, in our gin. And so away we went and started distilling uh, 20 years ago, um, and then like five years ago, we, we relocated the distillery to our, our bigger facility in Milton, Delaware, both with a bunch of beautiful pot stones from Vendome in Kentucky. And then once we trialed in Crowlers to go, our can we've been working on canned cocktail recipes for like 15 years. We really perfected them about four or five years ago and said, let's, let's go for it. We think this is gonna be a growing uh, space. And because we wrote the, the legislation, we have, like you, very friendly legislation that allows for multiple locations, distilling permits just separated by a TTB you know, line in the building of where we're distilling or, or brewing. So we most recently added this uh, continual head frame uh, still so that we can make our, our spirits and infuse them through our homemade uh, spicing pods uh, with, with the culinary ingredients that we uh, use in there. I'll get to our beers in a minute, but here's uh, where this space is. And I know uh, just from visiting uh, some amazing uh, breweries uh, yesterday, that you guys are able to, to not just op look at opportunities to distill and to make ciders, but to serve each other's stuff in your own uh, location. So hanging out with, uh, you know, unified uh, Beer works yesterday in rare, rare form, and seeing them serve ciders and RTDs from other um, um, uh, New York distillers was really kind of in inspiring. Showed that collaboration, but we all know this beyond beer space is going to be high in growth. Dogfish is always thought as a beyond beer um, liquid maker. At first, it was hybrids of meads and 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 wines and beer. Like our raison d'etre from '97 was designed to be like a red wine character. Our Midas Touch from '90 was a mead uh, beer hybrid, but the same thing with that distillery. We wanted to see if we could take some distilling DNA, bring it into the world of beer uh, and vice versa. Um, so that's our spirits business. Our newest physical home is, uh, uh, we, we have a brewery now in the arts district of, of Miami, uh, Dogfish Miami. That one's been a lot of fun from an ag perspective too, because we partnered with the University of Florida's ag program. They have a campus in Southern Florida that's all about um, cultivating tr trials of tropical fruit that have yet to really be commercialized or scaled. So we've been working with them uh, and we've des designed our own machine called a quenching engine, which is the the same scale and liquid as our 20 barrel brew house, but it's just designed to perfectly 
calibrate a citified wort that we can we can uh, keep on site to stream in uh, for our fruited uh, sours there. Uh, so then, uh, sort of, if that's sort of our newest location, uh, I did want to uh, spend a minute on. Um, our, our, our dogfish in so we, we opened a little 17 room boutique hotel a guy on our board was the chief creative for ace hotels based in new york and uh, portland and he helped me he, he and i designed uh this hotel and it's just 17 rooms in the backyard we have a beautiful fire pit and if i'm home on a saturday night i do fireside chats where i just bring a cooler of cold beers out and invite all the 17 rooms to come and hang and drink with me and it's honestly probably the most impactful meeting of my week because a they have to bring their own beers it's illegal for me to buy them for them uh, and I asked we asked them to bring beers from their regions wherever they're coming from and if they're people who care enough to go on vacation at a beer themed hotel uh, it's really a, an awesome conversation to see our brand through our their eyes what they're what they think we're doing well what we could do better uh, and it's a space where we can go super deep with our our fans uh, you know if they hang out they come for a tour at the brewery that's an hour they go for dinner at our pub that's at two but here's somewhere they can get to know our co-workers our, our company's culture for at least uh, 24 hours. You guys have done an amazing job of creating uh, cool opportunities to, to to do things for with your businesses. I think the the, the, the coolest of them is your farm uh, your farm law brewery law. I believe it lets you have up to five uh, locations um, and the opportunity to create those those you know brand curated spaces to go deep with with customers and let's face it at a, in a more profitable way than through the three tier system. At this moment when distributors are inundated with this long tail of all these different canned products from beers to seltzers to RTDs. I do think for many of us of, of, uh, of smaller scale, that opportunity to create other owned locations uh, is is a really fun one uh, for you guys to do. It creates jobs. If you do it under that farm thing, I think it's 60% of the, 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 the base has to come from uh, New York ingredients. I know there's a bunch of the farmers and hop growers uh, and, and barley makers in the room. Uh, so I think that's an awesome opportunity. Talking, I think, Dave, last night, I, they, you guys said it's amazing that you're over 500 breweries, second most breweries of any uh, state in the country, but that it's a little underwhelming getting the support of the Republicans to also support the liquids made by the, the New York brewers. Um, and that, that's kind of the same everywhere, but I, I imagine it's a bigger challenge here. Uh, you know, one opportunity I'd see is come up with your own style. The West Coast IPA wasn't called the West Coast IPA until, you know, the brewers on the West Coast decided to call it that. And because you guys have such a great ag community, if you come up with like a New York pale ale and it's made with, you figure out which hops you, you guys grow beautifully here. I know not all varieties grow great everywhere. I know some hop varieties are proprietary and that can't really work. But if there are public domain hops that grow great in New York and grains that grow great, you come up with your own style of IPA and 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 do that, you know, with the, with the gill, create an untapped badge for New York pale ale, whatever it is. And then, you know, the publicans are forced to reckon with, do you want to help the, the you know, the, the, the economy of, of the other entrepreneurs in your state or, or, or don't you? So, I mean, I think you guys are really well positioned for what you can grow here and just how strong you guys are as a community of craft brewers to, to, to tackle that opportunity. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, so the inn's probably our smallest revenue business, but it's the, it's so it's a part of our soul of our company and really important. So there's the the production brewery in Milton. So we have a ten gallon one. I have a one barrel brewery in my cabin up at Dogfish Head, Maine. And then we have a five barrel brewery, a seven, a 100 and a 200. I don't know how to brew on the 100 or the 200, uh, but I love uh, still my favorite part of the of my job is being on a paddleboard or a run or hungover this morning and thinking of an idea for a beer or a name for a beer and then working with my coworkers to see if we can bring it to life. So I still get to uh, do that and get involved in a beer recipe, not every month, but at least every, every quarter I'm, I'm shepherding forward something that might only see the light of day in our own locations or like sequent jail or uh, you know our our our, our cocktails, they might go out uh, coast to coast. Um, so uh, yeah, that's the big brewery, big distillery. You could see we're really thoughtful to not have it, you know, once we got profitable, we're like, we need our spaces to reflect our off-centered brand. And so we would invest in the aesthetics and the materials and work with local companies to, to build a space that felt like the Dogfish brand. Uh, and I think at our, at our most pre 
pre-pandemic, we'd have about a quarter million people come through from tours. Uh, you know, as Rich said, it's awesome to see stuff coming back. We're in person. It's vibrant. We just had our biggest day of revenue ever last weekend at Milton in our history of the brewery, partnering with a local clothing brand, a mom and pop clothing brand, and the Delaware State Beaches for them to do their state licensed beaches uh, passes. And so we brought together the community aspect, you know, the head, the heart, and the hand at this one event. And the karma was real. It was our biggest uh, day ever. So it's great to see that happening as we come out of COVID. Um, for sake of time, I won't spend too much time on our, our beer portfolio. But again, there's different models that are all valid, the sort of fast follower model, people that are really good at executing a trend that they already see in the marketplace is a very valid model. For us, it's always been the pioneering model, trying to find, you know, white space and do things that haven't been done before. You, that means you're usually going to flame out and crash and burn more often than the, the, the safer, fast follower route. But it also means if you find a valid white space, it, it could be really, you know, sustainable and your brand will be associated with it. With, you know, 90 Minute, there, was, there were Imperial Stouts in, in the world before we did 90 Minute, and there were certainly IPAs, but we were the first brewery to make an Imperial IPA uh, in, in 90 Minute and start, you know, distributing that coast to coast in the late, late 90s. We came up with our own vib vibrating football continual hopping device uh, for 60 minute, 90 minute, 120 minute. That device is now in the permanent collection of the Smithsonian uh, and, re and really is a story that works because it makes the beer really hoppy without being crushingly uh, bitter. Uh, and then each beer we try to take through that lens is the liquid unique and, and is the liquid something people will want to buy again? And can the story of the liquid kind of be the de facto marketing for that beer because it's something that folks uh, haven't done before? And it's awesome that there's now 9,000 breweries and it's harder to find that white space and you put in a name and then you put a Google behind it you're like fuck someone brewery in Portland already thought of that name um, that's harder all of that finding that white space but it's even more cathartic when you find it in this sea of passionate craft brewers also trying to do uh, creative things so that's still probably the most motivating thing for 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 me is finding that uh, white space and then and so I, sh I should also say we Three years ago, we chose to merge our company with uh, Boston Beer, Sam Abs, and to spend a minute on that decision. You know, I mentioned there, were, there was a, a shakeout period in the late 90s, and then four or five years ago, my wife Mariah and I uh, kind of saw that if you looked at what were the top 50 IRI defined, not Brewers Association, but big world of beer defined craft breweries, the majority of them were run by international uh, conglomerates. And I was on the board of the, the Brewers Association with Nick Matt, with uh, Jim Cook, with Ken Grossman. And when we came up with the definition of an indie craft brewery uh, so that we could differentiate ourselves from international companies that were selling beer as if they were coming from American uh, craft, craft breweries, American owned craft breweries. So so Mariah and I saw that kind of the second shakeout for larger scale breweries uh, and, the, and the wave of the new model of tasting room breweries and, and how strong economically that was. And we were already a national brand, but when you're selling beer for 15 years in Austin, when there were only two breweries in Austin, and then you go back and there's 40, and the tasting room breweries at the bar that you've had a tap for 10 years, and they're like, why do you keep having that dogfish beer on tap? I'm brewing beer across the street from you. We didn't have a national sales organization. We didn't have national marketing, really. And we kind of said, you know what? We can either go two directions as we see the second shakeout uh, unfolding. We can either retract and go back to being a mid, mid Atlantic or, you know, Northeast Mid-Atlantic Brewery, in which case we probably would have had to let 40, 40 or 50 people uh, go, or we can go for it and merge with another like-minded brewery that fits within the Brewers Association's definition of indie craft. And really for us, there was only one choice because we brewed a beer in collaboration with Sam Adams like 10 years ago for Savor, the Beer and Food Fest, and I got to know all the people in Boston, not just Jim, and I called Mariah and said, they're, they're really like us, they're super fun, uh, but they're, they're, they're ambitious, they're they're competitive, but they like to have a lot of fun. So the yada 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 was we, we did the, that merger so that, uh, you know, it was about combining uh, uh, companies that had uh, sort of complementary portfolios, right, pre-merger. Uh, Boston Beer was strong in seltzers, in ciders, in lagers. Uh, Dogfish Head was strong in IPAs, in ciders, in spirits. And we knew that Cran Co Can Co Cocktails was on the horizon. So we knew we were more complementary than competitive in portfolios. Portfolio. And the same thing with our, our values. Like when we opened up our roof, Mariah and I, and showed our rules of thumb, which are our value statements. The first one is we are an 
off-centered goodness and together we are heavy. And the, the first one on Boston beer side is we are the Boston beer company. And in both cases, it was about people before products that trends change and, and things come and go with, with what's cool styles. But if you've got amazing, talented people and you keep those people happy and energized, you can weather any trend and, and hopefully be in front of it and part of uh, the growth wherever, wherever the market takes us. So that's what drove sort of our decision uh, to do that merger. Um, and I think, you know, just showing you some of the stuff we do for programming now that we do have national sales, national marketing capability, we over index in concentric circles for the amounts of SKUs that we sell from our coastal Delaware brewery. As I mentioned, we have small canning and bottling lines that you have to come to the location to get some stuff. And then in our Atlantic sales division, we have more SKUs in the three tier system than we have across the whole country. But when we do not, when we do programs, we try and make them relevant with partners uh, that uh, that will resonate nationally. So, you know, we're, we'll be doing this collaboration with Patagonia and a collaboration with Igloo for the most, you know, economically or eco-friendly uh, material uh, cooler ever, ever built. And we're doing that intentionally launching it as part of uh, Earth Month, which is which is April. So just wanted to share an example of how we bring our message to market. Uh, my wife, Mariah, deserves a lot of credit for our beer and benevolence program. So we've always, once we had financial strength, gave back to the communities that gave us sustenance, kind of back to the uh, the, the, the the heart part of the head, heart, and hand uh, approach for us that's mostly been environmental causes because the open lands is where our culinary and brewing ingredients grow. We've uh, donate over a million dollars to the Nature Conservancy. That's probably our biggest nonprofit partner. We've also donated a lot of money to build a network of bike trails and paddleboard kayak ramps between the three towns where our locations are. So if you come and stay at the inn or stay at our state parks campground, you can you know hopefully enjoy a few drinks and kayak or bike through the beauty of coastal Delaware to visit the Dogfish Head locations and the other 10 or 15 breweries that are now along those uh, trails uh, as well. So we are really thoughtful about what nonprofit communities we invest in. And it's not all uh, just about, you know, uh, altruism and giving it away, we know that we're also investing in ways and in places that brings that halo back to enhance the dogfish brand while it's hopefully doing good things uh, for our community as well. So that's our, our, our little uh, uh, five barrel, or no, that's the seven barrel in Milton. It's got the same sort of computer brains, pneumatics, and everything is our 200. It has miniature spicing pods, miniature continual hopping devices so that we can replicate everything that we come up with on the five, press a button, send that recipe over the 200, and we don't even have to do match brews right out of the, right out of the tank. It's all designed with the same geometry, time in, in mash done, et cetera, uh, to replicate from this uh, uh, seven uh, to the 200 uh, seamlessly, uh, really proud of that. Um, and I believe this is a, a slide that I just stuck in to say, you know, uh, th this is my last slide and if there's questions uh, and there's time for them, I'll take them. But it was a, 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 I had a wonderful night last night and you know, the brewers were, were so kind uh, to invite me open in, in, into their spaces. And as we were driving home from, from the breweries, myself, Paul, Dr. J, definitely check out Dr. J's speech. It's going to be awesome. Um, and Kevin uh, from Rear Form. Kevin and I were in the back seat, and his wife's a, a, a painting artist, and we were both talking about how we go to these events, and, you know, we think of what we make as art and, and the brewer's art, but that we would not sit in front of a, a room full of non- uh, brewers and say, oh, I'm an artist. Uh, but I, I, I know at events like this and when we're out in the convention store and when we're together uh, drinking the beers, I know that we do look at each other with, with pride as artists. And we, along with our amazing customers, coworkers, and our suppliers, Think of what we get to do every day. We come up with a work of fiction in our own minds, whether we're a brewer or someone that is thinking of an event to do at the, the brewery or come up with a shirt design. And then a whole bunch of people come together and turn that work of fiction into a work of nonfiction. And we're so lucky uh, to get to do that. And everything I've seen, you guys are, are doing it beautiful, uh, beautifully here in New York. So my hat's off to you guys. Cheers. Thanks for this opportunity uh, to talk with you. I don't know. There may be a few questions if anyone does does have them. I don't know that we have a mic. I can repeat a question. What's that? Oh, there's a mic in the middle if anyone's got a question. I think we got 10 minutes. Anyone? I mean, I got a lot of questions. 
Here's a question. Hi. Hey. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, so Barton Batten is uh, one of my favorite beers. Um, it really sort of made me step up my home brewing game. Yeah. It was a, a four-pack, 12-inch bottles for 18 bucks, and I couldn't afford that at the time. Um, can you just sort of speak a lot about what it is? My understanding is it's like a barley wine or an old ale blended with a fresh IPA and possibly yeah. dry hopped again. And then um, as a follow-up to that, um, you keep that beer year-round. Yep. So, and yep. It was, oh, sorry, on you go. You, you, oh, is there something else? Yeah, I, I was going to say, um, so you, you keep that year round and it's like a blended, you know, final product. And then you also have Sequench, which is also a blend of three beers. Um, can you speak to some of the challenges and opportunities that having year round, you know, logistical, like how you yeah. sort of execute those types of products? Yeah, and I, I know a lot of you guys have barrel programs and are, you know, running like Solaris, you know, scenar scenarios and pulling some liquids and, and blending them with others. For us, we do have a, a few, uh, five or so, two to 300 barrel wooden fooders, either made of Palo Santo wood from, from Paraguay or uh, oak and the Burton Baton. That was our response, really, to when Stone and Russian River and all those guys were like, IPAs are a West Coast thing. And I was like, no, 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 because a brewery called Ballantine's uh, right on this East Coast in New Jersey brewed these beautiful big uh, IPAs back in the day. They, 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 they were kind of the last commercial, you know, of, of the um, heritage breweries that focused on that IPA style, but they had this one beer just called Burnt Nail uh, that was brewed and aged in wood tanks, and it was a very a strong IPA. So we were trying to say, hey, no, no, the baton of IPAs is still staying on this East Coast with that beer, and it was a, a blend of English Old Ale and, and Imperial IPA, but then aged in wood. Sequench Ale is uh, 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 the is a is three beers brewed in sequence, and we try to make the names of our beers work really hard to describe their points of differentiation, like slightly mighty, slight in character, slight in calories, mighty in hop character. Uh, and Sequench Ale is three beers brewed in sequence. Uh, using sea salt and designed to be really thirst quenching. So day one, we brewed Kolsch in a, in a very low acid environment of wort that the yeast really loves. And then the second day in a triple batch fermenter, we add a thread of uh, Goza made with sea salt from Maine and both of the Chesapeake. And then the second batch of that second day uh, is a Berliner Weiss made with black limes and lime juice. So it creates an environment for vigorous fermentation by starting the yeast just in the Kolsch. Uh, and it's a beer that has tons of complexity, but only like 10 IBUs. So it's super drinkable, can appeal to, you know, a margarita drinker as much as uh, a sour beer drinker. But it's a pain in the ass. The brewers hate it. Uh, <laughs> when you have to do anything that's that time consuming on a production level. So we try to just balance, you know, having beers like 60, that are easy yeast donors from, from a, a brewing pr production, but making sure we're saving space for those more exotic uh, beers too. Question, I can repeat it if you don't want to get up. Where's THC at on my personal radar? Or? <laughs> I will say I'm, 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 I'm going to Detroit in a couple of weeks to take a car across the Canadian border uh, to see where THC is on my radar. Uh, it's legal in New York. And so I will say I think it's public knowledge that our company, Boston Beer, has made an investment to launch THC beverages in Canada. And that's a project that I'm having a lot of fun uh, working on with my coworkers. Uh, our position, it's cool watching some breweries go for it in the states where it's legal, whether it's Colorado or Cali or here. I know in Maine, uh, the, 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 the entrepreneurs behind um, Shipyard have launched some THC beverages, and these obviously have to be sold just through the channels that sell uh, you know, recreational marijuana, so the number of outlets is small and the volume is small, but I think everyone agrees it's going to be a sustainable growth space. Uh, for uh, for beverages, uh, I know our company believes that, but we're, we've decided as a public company that we're not going to take any risk to launch THC beverages in the U.S. until the federal laws and the banking stuff is worked out. But it's cool watching a bunch of uh, smaller entrepreneurial breweries say, "No, in my state it's legal. I'm going for it," and they're going to have a first to market advantage, frankly, uh, by by taking those chances if they don't lose all their money to the feds. So. But it's an exciting category. What else? Oh, question here. So I'm sure you get a lot of pushback with your out-of-the-box um, ideas. I was wondering, how do you embrace being a risk-taker from a leadership standpoint? 
Well, uh, again, I'm going to thank my my wife and coworker Mariah, who usually before I'll bring I write the email to a brewer or a marketer or some a leader at our company. I'll, I'll, I'll bring it to Mariah up that over coffee after I do a paddleboard or a bike. I come in and look at my notes thing. I'm like, what do you think of this? And immediately she's like, that's stupid bullshit. That's dumb. That one's not bad. You should go deeper on that. That's stupid. That's dumb. So having a great honest filter before you bring the ideas forward is important. I'm lucky to have that in, in Mariah. Um, but then I'll also say don't put the weight of the world on that innovation idea, uh, meaning that's why we have a 10 gallon, one barrel, five and seven, is we can, we don't even think about cost of goods or what style space is this liquid going to play in. We come up with the, the concept, we source the ingredients from wherever in the world, wherever they cost to fit the concept, and then we, we share that five, seven barrel batch in our own spaces. And then if it gets traction uh, and people dig it and we see that, we have 1.1 million social followers and we have really engaged in that human scale conversation with the people who try our liquids. And then if we get more confidence through that informal focus group, then that idea is less risky because it's proven on a small scale and then it might be something we roll out in the Atlantic to test it. And if it does well there, then we'd roll it out uh, nationally. So that's from a product perspective, but the embracing risk as a leader thing is really hard for, for, for all leaders I know, um, especially those that started as the mom and pop entrepreneurs where you had to wear a lot of hats and nobody really believed in you. And that part of your brain grows disproportionate to where you're like, no, this is my fucking idea and we're fucking doing it. And that can be hard on, on yourself when you can't move the idea forward or when you can't communicate to your coworkers or the customers why it's a good idea. So I think that's always a challenge entrepreneurs grapple with. All right, I think I'm almost at time. I don't think, is there any other questions or no? We're good. Let's go drink some beer and buy some stuff. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. Uh, appreciate you being here. Oh, there we got the questions right there. Um, yes, tomorrow morning, Dr. J will be uh, second keynote uh, tomorrow. So that's going to be amazing. So thank you, Sam. Um, I want to give you all a quick look at today's schedule. Um, I also want to take, uh, encourage you to visit. We have 85 plus exhibitors uh, here, and we'll have time throughout the day um, to go visit them. We also had a wait list to get in, so uh, thank you exhibitors for being here. We appreciate it. Also, we've added a supplier showcase downstairs, uh, which is just New York. So if you're curious about New York hops and New York malt, uh, sponsored by the Farm Bureau downstairs, um, I encourage you to go down there and, and, and spark up some new relationships. Um, and then also, uh, if you, in the back of the program, if you visit every single uh, exhibitor and fill out a little form, go downstairs and put it in a box that's going to be in the hospitality suite, um, which is uh, sponsored by Propagate Labs, uh, and you'll get a chance for a drawing in tomorrow night's award ceremony for a brew bag set. So thank you, brew bag and Scott for, for that. So uh, get those filled out, put it in the box downstairs. Um, other than that, I appreciate you all being here uh, and seeing your faces. It's been three years since we've, we've done this. So um, welcome, and I uh, hope you all have a great conference.